together as you make your way in. We're going to sing to our great God. Heaven thunder and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you fall. Faith commanded and the mountains move. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go. Amen. Let's put our hands together for our great God. Well, good morning. My name is Dave Ross. It's awesome to be here with you today. And today we have our girls ensemble. It's made up of girls from our young adult and high school age group. And we're going to continue to lead you in worship. Invite you to sing with us as we sing to our great King. I'm 
unmatched in all your wisdom. Sing it out to me. Unmatched in all your wisdom. our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. Let's proclaim that together. We lift up our great King Jesus. Here we go. Sing it out loud. Uh, you may have a seat. Good morning. Thanks so much for singing with us. We lift the name of Jesus high. That's a summary of just very succinctly what we do when we gather here together at Calvary Church, lifting the name of Jesus up high and pointing one another to him. It's great to be together. It's great to sing together. My name is Bo. I'm the senior pastor here at the church and it's going to be a privilege for me to kind of shepherd us and guide us through our time together here this morning. We're going to continue to sing together. We're going to open up God's Word together. We're going to come to the communion table and remember uh, the sacrificial death of Jesus uh, with one another. And it'll be a privilege for me to lead us through our time together this morning. There's a few things right now. I just need to take a couple minutes. I'm just kind of kind of rapid fire, go through some things that just we need to know about as the family here at Calvary Church. And the first thing is, as always, there's somebody here that it's their first time at Calvary. We know that that's true because every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday at Calvary. And we want to be able to be connected with each and every person. So if you're new, if you're first time here, if you've been here just a few times, we'd love to connect with you. Um, tough to do in this setting, but we've created a place where it can take place, and we call that our welcome gathering. It takes place immediately following this service, out the auditorium doors, head down to your right. There'll be some staff there, um, a few volunteers. I'll make my way over there. I'd love to be able to connect with you, answer any questions that you have, tell you a little bit more about Calvary Church. It's one of the ways that we help this big church to feel more like a family. Another way that we do that is by having lunch together. Uh, as always, lunch will be served after this service, around 12.15 or so, in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, so you can make your way there. You can grab your food. You can sit around tables and get connected with one another. Or there's another option with lunch today. That's to grab your lunch in Fellowship Hall and head over to the fifth grade room and spend some time 
with my good friend Dave Ross, who leads us in worship. Dave's one of our newer staff members here at Calvary Church, and uh, we just want you to have the opportunity to get to know uh, him and his family a little bit more. So we're doing that this Sunday and next Sunday, casual, informal. He's going to share his testimony, answer some questions. Uh, so you can grab your lunch, head to the fifth grade room, uh, and get to know Dave uh, a, a little bit more. Love for you to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. We put a bulletin in your hand when you walk through the doors. Lots of important information in there. The Thanksgiving offering insert is in again this week. Um, if you're not familiar with what this is, take some time to read through this. This is an opportunity for us as a church to, to, to be able to give over and above our regular giving to support some specific projects and opportunities that are listed here on this insert. You can designate your gift to the Thanksgiving offering. Our envelope system has its own envelope for that. You can, uh, if you give online, there's a drop-down box there that you can specifically give to that. Or you can give at our Thanksgiving Day service. We continue to have a tradition here at Calvary Church. We gather uh, on Thursday of Thanksgiving, 10 o'clock, for just a, a, an hour long of just giving praise and testimony and thanks to God. So if you join us on that, uh, that morning, uh, the offering that morning goes to the Thanksgiving offering. This past week, we saw another act of violence in our country. This time it was in a church. And in just a moment, we will pray for that church. But it's brought up some questions in people's mind to say, hey, is there any place that we can go anymore where we are safe? And we know that our hope and our trust is beyond this world and beyond this life. But some have asked, hey, is, is Calvary Church a safe place for me to come? We have a security team here. We have constables that provide a security presence. We have plans in place for different types of things that could happen here on a Sunday morning. We actually practice those as a staff and volunteers to make sure that we are prepared. And we continue to evaluate and talk about our plan and continue to think about ways that we can try to be even safer as a church. But as you know, there's a tension there. As a church, we have the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we want to be a welcoming place for people to come, but we also want to be good stewards and uh, keep people as protected as possible. So we will continue to navigate the tension that is there. We will continue to ultimately trust in the Lord, and we will continue to put our hope and trust in Him, and our ultimate hope and trust is beyond what anybody could do to us physically. So, um, so there's a, a, an aspect of that that we want to be wise, but we also want to live and have great faith as well. Speaking of faith and speaking of protecting and serving. This weekend was Veterans Day, and as we do each year here at Calvary Church, it's just an opportunity for us to take a moment to thank those that have served. You know, it seems in the country that we live in now that we are less united as we've ever been. But even though it feels that way, and oftentimes that's a reality, we are still a free country. And we can thank the veterans that have served and those that are serving right now for that freedom. And it's an appropriate thing to do. So in this moment, would you honor us, veterans, by being willing to stand so that we can thank and honor you. So if you have served in any capacity in the military, I would invite you to stand right now and give us the opportunity to thank and to honor you here this morning. I know for many of you that were just standing, it can be a little bit of an uncomfortable thing, but I appreciate you allowing us to do that because it's our way of just, there's so much more that we would want to do, but our way of just uh, thanking you for your dedication and your commitment and your service. We are humbled and we are eternally grateful for it. Okay, let's look to the Lord together as we continue to worship in prayer. Oh God, our Father, we bow humbly before you this morning. You are an almighty king and a loving father. 
You reign powerfully, you rule justly, and you govern graciously over your world, your church, and our lives. You desire for your glory to shine forth through creation, through your people, and through your church for all the world to see. And as we gather this morning, we pause and we thank you that we can come together freely. We give thanks to you for the veterans that we honor today who served and sacrificed so that we can freely gather and freely worship you. But Father, our heart breaks over the loss of life of those worshipers at the Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. We pray for the families of the victims, for those wounded who are still recovering. We just want this senseless violence to end. Bring peace, bring justice, bring mercy to our country and to this world. But Father, it's also a reminder today that there are many around the world who are persecuted because of their faith in you. For those that can't gather openly, for those that have to be aware of every word and every action because they just don't know who might be watching we lift our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world up to you this morning. Your word tells us that you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against that plan. So Father, whether it is through peace and freedom or whether it is through trials and persecution, please continue to grow and to build your church so that your glory can continue to be spread to the ends of the earth. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our ushers are going to come forward. We're going to receive our morning offering as we continue to worship together. passes you, invite you to join us and stand and sing this last stanza together. Bye. 
I thank you for sending your son to die for us, Lord. We don't deserve that. I pray that you would humble us as we receive your word today. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. This morning we continue in the one story. It's the one story of the Bible. It's the one story of life. It's the one story that explains life. The story started in a very good place. Genesis chapter 1. Things were good as God created the world and God created human beings. And we read in Genesis chapter 2 that things got very good as human beings were made in his image. Chapters 1 and 2 set the stage. It introduced the main characters, God and his glorious attributes, human beings and our glorious potential. But then in week 3, Genesis chapter 3, things got very bad. Sin Satan enter the scene and it it shows the problem. It shows the problem, and we'll talk about this more today, of why things are the way they are in the world that we live in. And it isn't interesting that things in this story started really good and then quickly turned bad and tension and conflict entered the story. And it's interesting as we look at the stories that we tell, Oral history that's passed down, great works of literature, movies, theater, that the stories that we tell follow the same structure as the story that God has given to us. Things often start well and then a tension and a conflict enters very quickly. And if we're not careful, we can look at the, the story of the Bible, the story of us, and say, well, that's just a myth. It's a fantasy. It's just like everything else that we see and we watch. It happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And we say, no, this is true. This is real. This is the story of God and who we are and explains what's going on in the world that we live in. So week one, chapter one, things were good. Week two, chapter two, things are very good. Week 3, chapter 3, things are very bad. Where do things go from here? But before we get to that, somebody asked me this week, hey, we took three weeks to cover three chapters. Can we expect that pace to continue through this one story? And they reminded me that there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. So I did the math. If we continue at our current pace... And take no Sundays for Christmas or Easter or anything else. And we just do one chapter, one week from here on out. The one story will finish on August 5th of 2040. (laughs) So fasten your seatbelts. We're going to see who's really committed. I will be 66 years old. And I've set that date as my retirement from Calvary Church (laughs) to see if it can coincide with the end of the story. I don't think you all would allow me to last that long if that was really the plan. No, that's not the plan. Today is the beginning of things picking up the pace just a bit. But we needed to do what we've done the last three weeks to set the stage, to set the theological framework for this story. For those of you that know your Bible, you're going to, or or even those that don't, you're going to see over and over and over again how throughout the rest of the story, things will hearken back to these first three chapters because it really sets the framework for where we're going. So we needed to dig in over these last few weeks, and now things 
We'll pick up a bit. So this will be more of a broad coverage of the next eight chapters of Scripture. And we're going to look today at Genesis 4 through 11, where things just get worse. From Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden, things just spiral downward. And we're going to look and we're going to zoom in on some of the specific stories that we see over these eight chapters. But my goal for today is to help you to understand the broad sweep and the purpose of these eight chapters as we go through this this morning. Genesis 4 through 11. Before we dig into the details, I want you to see the literary structure Of what happens here and understand the intentionality that Moses is the author of this guided and directed by God and the Holy Spirit brings to us so that we can understand how this story unfolds three events separated by three genealogies the first event that we'll look at in Genesis 4 is Cain and Abel And as we dig into their story and and zoom in a little bit and see what happens with them, then when we get to Genesis chapter 5, we encounter a genealogy. Some of you have tried to read through the Bible. You've done one of those read through the Bible in a year plans. And you get to these genealogies and you say, why is this there? I'm just going to skip over this. Why do I need to read this person gave birth to this person and this person gave birth to this person and this and then this person died and then this person was born and then this person died. It's like, why is it even there? I'm just going to skip over it. It's there for a very important purpose. First, it lets us know that this is not mythical, that this took place and it happened in its real history. But it's letting us know that time is passing. It's letting us know that time is passing. And then what Scripture does is, as time is passing, it will zero in and zoom in on important biblical events that we need to know about. The Bible is very selective in what it tells us. There's lots of questions that we'd love to have answered that the Bible doesn't provide those answers for. And it's okay to wonder about those things, but we're responsible and we need to dig in to what is given to us and what we do have and what we can understand from that. So Cain and Abel, then a genealogy. Time is passing. And as time passes, then we get to a point that we zoom in and get some more understanding about a specific story. And that's what happens with Noah in Genesis 6 through 9. Now you see here, visually up here on the screen, there's some picture frames that are behind those main pictures. This is just to indicate that there's other things happening. There's other stories that could could take place, but God zeroed in for us on what is noteworthy, on what we need to hear about and what we need to know in order for the story to be pushed forward. It's not surprising that after God reveals and tells us what we need to know about Noah, we encounter another genealogy. And as we encounter that other genealogy, then again, God zooms in on a time period that probably took place during that genealogy to tell us one more story, the Tower of Babel. And then again, it's not surprising that at the end of chapter 11, we encounter another genealogy. Three events separated by three main genealogies that help to tell us time is passing, things are unfolding. Here's some specific events that we have to dig into and understand as things develop. But generally speaking, over the course of these eight chapters, the numbers of people on planet Earth are increasing, but the functionality of these human beings is decreasing. Are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Things are getting worse. And the scripture is telling us that and we need to know that and that's important for us to see so that we can see how the story continues to unfold. So there's the general overview of these eight chapters. Let's dig in to the specifics. Genesis chapter 4, found on page 3, And we will start in verse 1 with this first historical event. And in the outline that you've given, that that, that you have there in front of you, I've just entitled this part, Sin Infiltrates the Family. 
And the family that we're talking about specifically is Cain and Abel. And Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 tells us what takes place. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. We ended chapter 3 with Adam and Eve sinning, falling short of the glory of God. They are graciously sent out of the garden, but God still told them to be fruitful and multiply. So at least they got that part right. And Eve gave birth to Cain. And she says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. God has provided for me. Why should, would she say that? Why is that important? She may be thinking back to what's told to us in Genesis chapter 3, 15. That it, could be from, that it will be from the, the offspring of the woman that God is going to provide the solution. She didn't have the full, complete, big picture. So she's saying, if God provides an offspring, maybe this offspring, maybe this son will be the one that brings about the solution to the problem. So she gives birth to Cain, verse 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. Now we're told a little bit more about them in verse 3. In the course of time, time passes, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. How did Cain know to do this? How did Abel know to bring an offering? We're not necessarily told. Did God tell them to do that? Was there something within them that said that that's what they should do? We're not 100% sure, but that's what they believed was the right thing to do and that what God wanted them to do. And as is the case in Scripture, it's not about the offering that's given. It's really about the heart that is behind it. So Cain brings an offering, and then verse 4, And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. God accepted Abel's offering. I think it was because of the heart in which he brought it to God. Verse 5, But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. And as a response... Cain was very angry, and his face fell. As a result of his anger welling up within him, God saw and God knew what was taking place. Was there sin there in his anger? We're not sure when sin entered, but the emotion of anger was there, and God calls him on it and he gives him caution and he gives him great warning and he says this in verse 7 if you do well Cain will you not be accepted and if you do not do well sin is crouching at the door do you see that personification of sin do you see how word sin is described there by the way this is the first time the word sin is mentioned In Scripture, we know that sin entered the scene in Genesis chapter 3. It's the first time it's mentioned. And now we start to understand a little bit more about sin. Where's your heart at, Cain? Sin is there. It's crouching at the door. It's looking for an opportunity. It wants to use the members of your body to commit sinful acts and sinful deeds. Sin wants to use you. And if you're not careful, your anger will lead the way for sin to come and to do what it wants to do in your life. So what happens as a result? Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. Sin was crouching at the door. And Cain said, come on in. In his anger... He said, come on in and do with my anger what you want to do. And it's not as if sin comes and we're kind of oblivious to what it's doing in our lives. No, we provide the opportunity for sin. And sin works in and through us to accomplish what it wants to do in our lives. We can't manage sin. And as we look at the anger of Cain, it's a great reminder that anger is a great way to identify a problem, but it's a lousy way to solve it. Some of us struggle with anger, 
And as we struggle with anger, as it comes up in our relationships, as it comes up in our marriages, as it come up, comes up in our parenting, in our work environment, sin identifies something that's going on below the surface. And for us to pay attention to that and say, God, what is it in me that causes me to get so angry with that person? It can identify the problem, but it's a lousy way to solve it. It's something that we need to pay attention to. When anger enters into relationships, it brings distance and dominance. And we've got to pay attention to it. As the story continues to unfold, Cain sins by murdering his brother Abel. And the Lord came to Cain and he said, Cain, where is Abel, your brother? It's a reminder back to Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned and God comes and says, Adam, where are you? The accountability of God of coming and asking the questions. Cain said back to God, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Some of you heard that phrase. You didn't know it came from the Bible. Am I my brother's keeper? And as you read the rest of chapter 4, you continue to see how things spiral out of control. Lamech is introduced into the story. And instead of taking one wife the way that God designed and created it for it to be, he took two. And we see that he also committed murder. Sin is infiltrating the family and making things not better, but worse. So we get to the end of Genesis chapter 4 and say, is there hope? What is next? What's going to happen in this story? Are things going to continue to unravel? Genesis chapter 4 verse 25. Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring. Things didn't work out too well with Cain and Abel. They weren't the solution to the problem of sin. Things just got worse with them. But Eve still has hope. And she says, maybe Seth will be the one. Maybe he will be the offspring that's going to bring the solution. And so we get to the end of Genesis chapter 4. And we're introduced to a genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. Time is passing. More people enter the scene and enter into the story. And this is where, again, read your Bibles carefully. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image. Isn't that interesting? That when God created man, God said he made man in the image of God. In his likeness he made man and woman. Now when it's talking about the children of Adam, we are told that Adam is now having sons in his own distorted, sinful image. You say, oh, that's interesting. Are they still in the image of God? Absolutely. But they're in the image of Adam. The human race was created in Adam and Eve. Did God continue to create human beings afterwards? In a sense, we say, yes, you know, he's knit me together in my mother's womb. But in a big sense, no. He didn't create in the way that he created Adam and Eve. He created a way for the human race to continue on. But we're all connected back to Adam and Eve. We are there in them. They are the parents of the human race. So because they sinned, all of us, therefore, are considered sinful. You say, well, that's not really fair. Let's talk about fairness in just a moment. But I want to illustrate it for you this way. How many seeds are in an apple? There is a finite number of seeds in an apple. If you were to cut an apple open, you could go and you could count the number of seeds in the apple, correct? What if you flip the question around? How many apples are in a seed? 
Is there any way to know? Is there any way to tell? And the answer is no. Because if you plant a seed, and that tree grows, and that tree has apples, and the seeds of those apples fall to the ground and grow, and there's more apples, it's an infinite number of apples that come from one seed. And they're all connected back to that original seed. They all have the characteristics back of that original seed. And that's the way it is with the human race. We're all connected back to the beginning. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Paul's understanding of this is when Adam sinned, we all sinned. You say, well, that's not fair. I wasn't there. You were there. I was there. The human race was there. We were all there in Adam. Well, that's not fair. Well, if that's not fair, look how unfair the solution is. A few verses later in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, the many, all of us, were made sinners. Well, that's not fair. So by the one man's obedience, who's that? Jesus. The many, that's all of you, will be made righteous. Well, that's not fair. You're right. That's what grace is. It's not fair. But God provided a solution in Christ for the problem that originated in Adam. So think about it this way. All of humanity is either in Adam or you're in Christ. All of us are born in Adam. It's our choice whether we are in Christ or not. That's it. We can divide people up however we want. Nations and race and preferences and whatever. When it comes down to it, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And it's our choice when it comes down to it in the end. So we will continue to talk more about that, obviously, as we go through this story. But let's come back and let's continue where we were. End of Genesis chapter 4. Things have gotten worse. However, there's always glimmers of hope. Your, your understanding of God should begin to be developed as we read this story. The character of God begins to come out. And even though there's sin and even though there's judgment, there's always hope when it comes to God. Genesis chapter 4 verse 26. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Things were spiraling out of control, but there were some people that were calling on the name of the Lord. So we flip into Genesis chapter 5 and we get that first big genealogy. People were born and people died. People were born and people died. Time passes. As time passes, is things getting better or are things getting worse? Maybe human beings have figured it out. Maybe we've learned the lessons from our ancestors and we've kind of figured out how to conquer sin. We read the list of the people that were given in Genesis chapter 5 and we come to the end of Genesis chapter 5 and we read this. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah. Well, I know that name. I've heard about Noah. And he said this. Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring relief from our work and from the painful toils of our hands. Do you see if you read carefully? There's people within the story that knew that things weren't right. And they're looking for hope. They're looking for a savior. They're looking for the person who is going to set things right. 
every son I assume that Eve gave birth to, she was saying, maybe he's going to be the offspring that's going to fix things. Now when Noah was born, somebody said, hey, maybe he's going to be the one that's going to bring relief. So we pull out of the genealogies and now we zoom into one person. Why? Because his story is significant. There's other stories, but his story is significant as God's plan unfolds. What's going to happen with Noah in Genesis chapter 6? Is he going to fix things? Are things getting better at this time? In Genesis chapter 6 verse 1, it seems that things are going in a good direction. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, hey, that's a good thing. God told them to be fruitful and multiply. Man is multiplying on the face of the earth. They're getting that right. That's a good thing, right? Man, maybe time is, enough time has passed that human beings have figured this out. You don't have to read too much further until you come to verse 5 and it says this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <sighs> things getting better, things getting worse. Things are getting worse. First sin infiltrated the family, now sin permeates the whole society. Genesis chapter 6 verse 6, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Does this mean that God's sitting there saying, I made a mistake? No, this means God is sitting there and his heart is grieved. Why? Because he's not removed from the story. He created human beings to have an intimate relationship with them. And when he sees what sin is doing and what sin has done, it grieves him to the core. So what does God do? God does what he has the right to do. He brings judgment. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But, there's always a but with God. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Here's one person is walking rightly with God. And God says, I'm going to do something through that one person. So in chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, we get the story of Noah. It's interesting that we teach this story to our kids and we sing songs and the animals come two by two. But it's a story of judgment and it's a story of heartbreak. And we know the story and we know what happens and what takes place. But it's also a story of hope. The ark was a place of salvation, a place of safety, a place of mercy for Noah and his family. If you know the rest of the story, several biblical authors refer back to the ark and how it pointed to salvation. And we come to the end of the flood and the waters recede and the dry land appears and there's a fresh start. Maybe it's going to be right this time. Maybe Noah and his sons and their families and everybody that comes to them will see the devastation that sin brought, will see the judgment that God brought, and say, we're going to get it right this time. We can drum up enough willpower to overcome sin. We can try harder this time. We can sing the songs and we can light a candle and we can throw a stick in the fire and we can commit even more and we can do it this time. I know we can and what does God say at the beginning of Genesis chapter 9, verse 1? He blessed Noah and his sons and he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And if you've been tracking with us, you say, Oh, that sounds really familiar. Almost word for word from Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. When God made Adam and Eve, he blessed them and he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Take two with Noah. I'm going to try this again. And as you read through the rest of Genesis 9, we're introduced something that we're going to have to track with through the rest of the story. It's God making a covenant, making a contract. God making a contract and he, he comes and he says, this has nothing to do with what you will do in response. This is all about me. 
He says, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky and it's going to remind me that I'm never going to do this again. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and I will remember. Is it because God forgets? No. I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. So we come to the end of Noah's story and they're going to get it right. There's hope. He was righteous. He's going to be the one. The story's going to take a turn for the better. But we come to the end of the story of Noah, and what do we get? We get another genealogy in Genesis chapter 10. It looks a little bit different than Genesis chapter 5. That was more focused on individuals. This is more focused on the descendants of Noah and the clans and the nations that they develop into. Even more time is passing And again, are things getting better or are things getting worse as more time passes? Worse, exactly, from the front row. Thank you. Things are getting worse, even more so. Probably during the time of the genealogy of Genesis chapter 10, God zeroes us in on one more specific story. And that's the story of the Tower of Babel. And what took place there? Verse 4. The people said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we'd be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You say, oh, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to do. But if you know the story, that's an awful thing for them to do. That's not what they're supposed to be about. But that's what we do as humans. We gather together and say, hey, let's make a name for ourselves. It's the pride of life. Hey, I want to get the, 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 the accolades and the pat on the back. I want people to think that I'm someone. Hey, let's make a name for ourselves. Is that what they were supposed to do? No. They were created in the image of God to reflect his glory. They were supposed to make a name out of him and out of who he is. They were supposed to fill the earth with his glory. And they said, no, we want to make a name for ourselves, and we don't want to go anywhere. We're staying right here on our recliners, on the couch. We don't want to be dispersed. We don't want to spread through all the earth. We don't want to show off God's glory. It's not what they were supposed to be doing. Sin infiltrates the family. It permeates the society. And now it is dominating the human race. And God again brings judgment. Verse 6. God said, Behold, they're one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. God brings judgment and he said, This place is going to be called Babel. Because the Lord confused their languages. And he dispersed them over the face of the earth. He did what they were unwilling to do. Side note pull out of the story just for a moment. For those of you that know the rest of the story, this is where God confused their language. Can you think of another time in Scripture where God actually took multiple languages and made so that everyone could hear and could understand? At Pentecost, exactly. That's what happened at Pentecost. Why did God, in a sense, reverse what happened at Babel at Pentecost? Because of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Some of you know that part of the story. Others are saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. Just tuck it away in the back of your mind. We'll get there in like 2032 or so. (laughs) We'll come back to that part of the story. God brings judgment. Not surprisingly, we get another genealogy at the end of Genesis 11. Events, genealogy. Event, genealogy. Event, genealogy. Things have just spiraled out of control. Things have not gotten better with time. They've only gotten worse. And as we come to the end of Genesis chapter 11, is there any ounce of hope? We're coming to the end of another genealogy so we can assume that maybe there's another event that God is going to zoom in on. And as he's just going through, if you read the end of Genesis chapter 11, it's just a list of names after name after name after name. But then God slows down a bit and we're introduced to somebody named Terah who had three sons. And one of those sons was named 
Abram. And we're told a little bit more about Abram here at the end of Genesis chapter 11. We're told that Abram took a wife and her, her name was Sarai. And we're told something specific right here at the end of Genesis chapter 11 that maybe should catch our attention if we've been paying close attention as this story goes along. Genesis chapter 11 verse 30 simply says this. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Huh, why is that interesting? Because of all the dysfunction of the human race up to this point, one of the things that they at least got right, they were fruitful and multiplied. They at least figured that part out. They figured out how things worked in that area of their lives. But this is the first time that there's a mention of somebody being barren and not having a child. And you say, but the solution has to come through the offspring. You'll have to stay tuned and see what happens. But it should pique our interest that we're introduced to somebody who could have no children. And what's going to happen when we turn the page to Genesis chapter 12? We'll see next week. But things are in a dismal spot. But as always, there's always glimmers of hope. And the glimmers of hope in these eight chapters are Abel and Enoch and Noah. Abel brought a right sacrifice because his heart was right before God. Enoch, right in the middle of the Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. We're really told nothing else about him at all other than the fact that he walked with God. We don't know anything else about his life. We don't know what he did. We don't know what his job was. In a time when things were just ordinary and things were spiraling downward and the culture around them was not in a good place, there's somebody who lived an ordinary life and was willing to walk with God. Would that be enough for you? We live in a culture that says, oh, you've got to make a great name for yourself, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do extraordinary things. Would it be enough for you to go through your life and the reputation that you have when you pass from this life to the next was just the fact that you walked with God? Would that be enough for us? God lifts Enoch up, says he walked with God, and then there's Noah. He found favor in God's eyes, and God used him. And it's interesting as the rest of the story again gives commentary on these three guys. When you come to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. This. Did they have access to the revelation that you and I have access to today? No. But they responded to God in the exact same way that you and I should, by faith. They responded to God with what was revealed to them, and they did it by faith. You and I do the exact same thing. Some of you know this verse, you just don't know it in the context of where it's written. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. In the middle of God talking about Abel and Enoch and Noah, he says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. When things have gotten as worse as they can be, there are still glimmers of hope because there are still people that are responding to God with faith. And that's what he asks of you and I. We just have more revelation than they did. We know who the solution is to the problem of sin. We know it's not a philosophy. We know it's not a program. We know it's not a technology. We know it's a person. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the reason why we come and we gather and we have communion together. Because it reminds us who our faith is in. So I'm going to invite the musicians to come back. I'm going to invite the communion servers to make their way down here to the front. And we're going to have the opportunity 
to be reminded in a physical, tangible way of who we are putting our faith and trust in. So we come and we gather today at the communion table, and it's an open table. You're all welcome to participate if you put your faith and trust in Jesus. You don't have to be a member of Calvary Church. Lots of children in the room. Parents, you know where your children are spiritually. This is a great teaching moment, teaching opportunity for them to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And you know where they are with the Lord. And if they understand what we're doing, they're more than welcome to participate. Nothing magical in the piece of bread and the little cup of juice. It just points us to the spiritual truth and the spiritual reality that Jesus is the one who is God's sacrifice for our sin. He's the one that, in a sense, they all were looking forward to. We look back to him and what he has done. And we are saved by our faith in him, not because we eat and drink of these elements. They're just a physical reminder of a spiritual truth. The way that we do this here at Calvary Church, I'll pray in just a moment. We'll distribute the bread. We'll hold that bread, and then we'll take and eat together, and then we'll do the same with the cup. I'll lead you through it all. But let's look to the Lord. Let's give him thanks now. Father, we see the problem of sin, not just on the pages of Scripture, but we see the effects of it and the ramifications of it in our own life and in the world that we live in. No matter how much time passes, no matter what's invented, no matter what programs are put in place, no matter what philosophies we adhere to, no matter how many books we read, there's nothing that solves the problem of sin that separates us from you. Nothing other than Jesus. Nothing other than your solution. Not a solution that we came up with, but a solution that you freely gave in Jesus Christ, your Son. So today, we remember, we give thanks, we owe our worship, and thank you for this physical, tangible way, bread and the cup, to be reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus and for his sacrifice. And we pray it in his name. Amen. To the cross I cling Of its suffering I do drink Of its work I do sing On in my Savior Both bruised and crushed Showed that God is love And God is just Let the cross you beckon me You draw me gently To my knees and I Lost for words so Lost in love I Sweetly broken, holy surrender. What a priceless gift. Deserve a life have I been given to Christ crucified? He called me out of death, He called me into life, and I was under. 
Now through the cross I'm reconciled Thank you, Jesus Let the cross you beckon me You draw me gently to my knees And I am lost for words so Lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. And at the cross, you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words. So lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. your redeeming love and how great is your faithfulness in all the cross I must confess how wondrous your redeeming love and how great is your faithfulness At the cross, you beckon me. You draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words. So lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. And at the cross, you beckon me. You draw me gently to my knees. For so lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy sacrifice of Jesus is what provides for our salvation. And this is a tangible way for us to give thanks and to remember. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together. We don't just remember the broken body of Jesus, but the shed blood of Jesus. Let's give thanks as well. Father, your word tells us that there's nothing that can wash away our sin except for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for that reminder. We're so grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Because of Jesus, all this promise won for me when He paid the highest ransom once for all for my freedom. I will boast in Christ. righteousness and not my own I will cling to Christ my home His mercy reigns now and forever love will never lose its power oh my faith 
feelings could not erase. Now I walk within your favor. Grace unending, my salvation. There is no other fount, there is no other source, there is no other supply other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And we remember that in what we take here together. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Now let's stand to our feet and let's be reminded of that truth one last time as we sing this together. Sing together, what can wash away my sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Amen and amen. If we can help, encourage, assist, whatever you might be dealing with in your life, would love to be able to help you as your family here at Calvary Church as we head out the doors right now. I want to remind you of the welcome gathering out to your right. Lunch is served in Fellowship Hall. And for those that want to connect with Dave Ross and his family, you can grab your lunch and head to the fifth grade room. Thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus. We're so, so grateful. May that minister to your heart today. God bless you all. You are dismissed.